There was a very, very rich young man uh, who watched a documentary on the television about monks. And he was so taken up with it that he thought, I want to know more. And I'm going back to my roots of the Catholic faith. And he thought, how can I achieve this? So he, he was that rich, he thought he'd shoot off to Rome and try and see the Pope. So he went to Rome and he was in St. Peter's Square and the Pope was doing walkabout. The rich young man got a seat or stood at the front of the queue of the row and the Pope was walking along and as he was walking along he was talking to the people who was blessing them. He went to a lady in a wheelchair and then he went to an older man and then he went to a tramp. Terrible tramp, smelly tramp. And he said something to the tramp. And then he came to the rich young man. And he walked straight past him. Ignored him. This upset the rich young man and he thought about it. And he remembered that there was somewhere where, I think it was St. Francis of Assisi, changed his clothes to look like a beggar. And he thought, I'll go and ask that tramp if we can exchange clothes. So he went to see the tramp. And he said to him... Uh, you know, swap clothes and I'll give you my Armani suit and I'll give you some money as well. And the tramp readily agreed to that. So they swapped. So the next day, the rich young man's there, dressed as a tramp, again on the front row, and the Pope's coming along, speaks to one or two people before he gets to the tramp, and then he gets to the tramp. And as he gets to the tramp, the tramp looks at him and the Pope goes and he bends down to him and he says to the tramp, Hey, Buster, I told you to get lost and never to come back here. It's a joke. <laughs> anyway. <sighs> I've come back and Jesus is coming back. I want to start by letting you into a little secret. Those who preach, well, most of them, including myself, usually read and research several books on the subject. Here are some of the books I've looked at on the passage I'm about to preach. All commentaries on Luke. They're very interesting, of course, but you've got to realise that uh, unless it's the Holy Spirit that gives you the inclination, divine inspiration, um, it's either coming from the heart, what I preach, or from the head, a bit of both. Either way, you've got to prepare for doing these types of talks. You don't have to be a theologian or read many books to discover what today's reading is all about. It's obvious, Jesus riding on a donkey into Jerusalem, or as my Bible states, or most Bible states, the triumphal entry. Perhaps what's not so obvious is that this triumphal entry is meant for all of us as we prepare with Jesus for his final weeks on this earth. Jesus prepared for that journey, for a journey it was, as he hadn't arrived at Jerusalem, Bethpage and Bethany he was, uh, whether that destination be Jerusalem or his heavenly kingdom, he hadn't arrived there yet, he was still on his way like we are today. The beauty of reading the Bible is interpreting a deeper sense of what is going on and what, is, what we're to look uh, for and the words Jesus spoke to his disciples on verse 30 and 31 bring us into a deeper sense of what this whole passage is about. <clears throat> Go to the village ahead of you and as you enter it you will find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why you're untying it, tell him the Lord needs it. Now, if you just pick up your Bible and casually read those two verses and move on to the rest of the passage, you're missing so much as they're loaded with questions and the answers may provide you with a deeper, deeper understanding of what is really happening. Uh, the Old Testament reading that uh, your daughter ran, read, which was brilliant, uh, shows that Zechariah prophesied that a future king of Israel would come to Jerusalem, Zion, in humility, gentle, 
and riding on a donkey, a colt, a foal of a donkey. Now the thing is that Jesus would have known that prophecy, even though it was written 500 years before and passed down through the rabbinic teachings. He was laying claim to be that king. God's anointed, the Messiah. And he endorsed that claim by using these four little words at the end. The Lord needs it. The Lord needs it. And in saying those words, he was echoing the words of Peter earlier on in Luke's Gospel in answers to Jesus' question, Who do you say I am? You are the Messiah, Peter said, sent by God. Now at this point, you've got to realise that by laying claim to that title, Jesus knew what was up, he was opening himself up to. And in a word, it was opposition, not least from the Pharisees and others, and they would be on him like a ton of bricks. But Jesus knew all this. In fact, he was prophesying his own death. But the next question you have to ask yourself is this. If Jesus was prophesying his own death, was he also prophesying about the donkey that was tied up and that no one had ridden? How did he know about that? And this is where preparation comes in. Both mine in preparing this talk and Jesus preparing for his journey into Jerusalem. As I mentioned, I prepared this talk by reading several books on Luke's Gospel and some of those books, written by theologians, suggest that Jesus had prepared and planned that whole episode with the words, the Lord needs it, being the password, either one that the owners knew because they knew Jesus as Lord and honoured him by allowing the animal to be taken to him personally. You know, the, the disciples came and said, the Lord needs it. And he would have said, you don't have to tell me any more. I know the Lord is. He's my Lord. You can have the donkey, take it. Or Jesus had fixed it up, prearranged it all with the owner that some men will come to your house and want that donkey. You give them it and they will stay. The Lord needs it. I'd like to think it was divine, it was a prophecy. But not only was Jesus preparing the crowds, uh, uh, preparing for that, but he was also preparing the crowds, spreading their cloaks on the road. It's only in the other gospel accounts that palm branches are mentioned. And you can imagine that spreading your cloaks, if somebody now spread cloaks in front of us and we walked on it, it would be like perhaps walking on a carpet or the red carpet. You know, they were preparing the way for Jesus. And it was an acknowledgement, a significant sign, uh, a bit like putting out the red carpet, that Jesus was who he proclaimed to be the Messiah or King. At this point, we need to put into context the reception Jesus was receiving the feast of the Passover was nearing, uh, was nearing and crowds would have flocked up to Jerusalem and consequently would have been well versed in singing what they call the Psalms of, uh, of Ascent. As the Jews went to the temple, they would sing these Psalms as they approached the temple. Hence they sang Psalm 118, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. It's interesting to note that the other gospel writers use the word Hosanna, which uh, uh, in Hebrew translates, O oh Lord, save us. The crowds were wanting a king who would save them from the tyranny of the Roman occupation of their land. Jesus did come to defeat an enemy, but not quite the one they had in mind. And a couple of the songs that we've sung this morning and are going to be singing uh, have the words Hosanna in their lyrics. And sometimes the phrase pops up in our church liturgy. So what you've got to remember in singing Hosanna, 
We're praising God. It reminds us that he will save us and he is the source of our salvation. We at times may be like the crowd. We might cry out to Hosanna because we have things in our lives that perhaps we're struggling with. It can be anything. I know I have things that I am struggling with. And uh, perhaps crying out to God reminds us that Jesus defeated the ultimate enemy, which is sin. Now, maybe here some this morning are struggling with those obstacles or difficulties in their lives. You may be, you may feel wounded uh, by what someone's perhaps said or done to you. But take heart, Jesus has already trodden that path, the path of humanity. Luke tells us later on in his gospel that Jesus wept, wept over Jerusalem, just as many today are weeping over the events taking place in the Ukraine and the world. But the Bible tells us we don't have a priest who is out of touch with our reality. He's been through weakness and testing, experienced it all but the sin. So we need to walk right up to him and get what he's ready to give and take the mercy that's offered and accept it. We have a priest who is out of touch with our, real, with our reality. Somebody told me years ago that what we're experiencing today, folks, not just in our own lives, but the lives of everything that's going on in the world. It may be reality, but it's not the truth. It ain't the truth. When Pontius Pilate had Jesus stand in front of him, he said to Jesus, what is the truth? And Jesus was the truth. He didn't have to reply. He is the truth. I finish with this on screen. One of my favourite paintings by a favourite artist, Caravaggio, an Italian who killed a man. He was a sinner like us all. But what a wonderful, wonderful painting. It's called The Incredulity of Thomas or of Saint Thomas. And it shows Thomas putting his finger in Jesus' side after Jesus had been crucified. But his doubts were answered by Jesus. Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Stop doubting and believe. It was a question of believing and then seeing. Not seeing and believing, but believing and seeing and that's what we've to do we've to believe and we see I was blind but now I see that's what John Newton the hymn if that's you with doubts or you feel wounded by a burden of whatever kind remember that those words that uh, put your finger here it's not just about believing the fact of the resurrection. But it's a story about believing. And this is the thing, folks. It's a story about believing that we can all be wounded. And we are all wounded. Truth down, we all know that. We all know that we're all sinners. I'm not a sinner. Yes, you are. We're all sinners. But we can be wounded and we can be resurrected at the same time. That's a wonderful, wonderful thought. We're all wounded, but we can be resurrected at the same time. So as we approach Holy Week, let's look forward with a renewed hope to next Sunday. We'll be, or Rob will be, <coughs> quarter to six in the, uh, is it, in the churchyard? Please come and join Rob, and I'll be there as well, ushering him on. But come next Sunday and greet our risen Lord with the cry, He is risen. 
He is risen. And we all respond. He is risen indeed. Be excited to prepare to encounter the one true living God with shouts of Hosanna and wave our palm crosses to welcome him among us. Amen. Amen. Amen.